Good morning, everyone. I now call this remote meeting of the House Climate and Energy Finance and Policy Committee to order, and we will begin by taking the roll. Chair Long. Present. Vice Chair Akum. Present. Minority Lead Swazinski. Minority Lead Swazinski. Representative Bierman. Present. Uh, Representative Bo. Present. Representative Christensen. Present. Representative Franson. Present. Representative Grunhagen. Representative Grunhagen. Swazinski's here. Representative Hollins. Representative Hollins. I think she'll be a few minutes late. Certainly. Uh, Representative Hornstein. Present. Representative Igo. Present. Representative Lee. Representative Lee. Lee present. Representative Lippert. Present. Representative Liz Lagarde. Present. Representative Mecklens. Present. Representative Munson. Present. Representative Stevenson. Present. A uh, quorum is present, members. Uh, today yeah. we have four members. Mr. Representative here. I don't know. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative Grunagan's here also. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll note that uh, Representative Swazinski and Representative Grunhagen are present. Um, members, we have four bills on the agenda today. Um, and we do have minutes uh, from uh, February 23rd, 2021. Um, Representative Akum, would you like to move the minutes? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, I move the minutes. Representative Akum moves the minutes from February 23rd. Any discussion to the amendments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendments are adopted. Our first bill on the agenda today uh, is Representative Lippert's bill. Um, Representative Lippert, would you uh, care to tell us about your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. To meet our climate goals as a state, we need to be addressing greenhouse gas emissions across our economy especially in areas of our economy where emissions have stayed stubbornly flat or slowly increased, like in the transportation sector and agriculture, in our buildings too. This policy will reduce the carbon intensity of fuels, driving the use of cleaner and cleaner fuels, and it will have a broad impact economy-wide. A clean fuels policy like this one is the top recommendation of Minnesota's Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council. According to their report, a clean fuels policy has been demonstrated to increase the use of lower carbon intensity fuels, such as biofuels, electricity as a transportation fuel, and hydrogen. They also point to its ability to attract investment in emerging clean fuels technologies, like aviation biofuel, for example. The goal of this policy is to focus on more than emissions reduction and economic development as well, um, also, but also to drive equity and environmental benefits too. The aim of the policy is to support equitable transportation electrification that benefits all communities and is powered primarily with low carbon and carbon free electricity to improve air quality and public health targeting communities that bear a disproportionate health burden from transportation pollution. And also uh, to support voluntary farmer led efforts to adopt agricultural practices that benefit soil health and water quality while contributing to lower life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from biofuel feedstocks. The coalition behind this legislation is broad, and you'll hear about the many ways that it would benefit Minnesota through the implementation of a clean fuel standard that will reduce the carbon intensity of fuels by 25% by 2035. I'll turn to the first testifier, Brendan Jordan of the Great Plains Institute, to say more about the future fuels policy and how it will work. Mr. Jordan, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Brendan Jordan. Uh, I'm the VP of Transportation and Fuels at the Great Plains Institute, and I'm, I'm here to offer my enthusiastic support for House File 2083, Senate File 2027, uh, bipartisan uh, legislation that would establish a clean fuels standard in Minnesota. Why is this an important issue for Minnesota to address? Well, in, a, in an era of, of bipartisan policymaking, uh, under the Plenty administration, Minnesota passed landmark legislation, the Next Gen Energy Act, 
again, on a bipartisan basis to address transportation emissions and petroleum replacement. Uh, the statutory goals of 30% petroleum replacement by 2025 and 80% greenhouse gas reduction are not being met today through voluntary goals. Uh, I believe policy will be required to get Minnesota back on track in meeting our goals. And the question is really what type of policy can be most effective and lead to the most benefit for Minnesotans. Minnesotans spend uh, over a billion dollars a year on liquid fuels for transportation and that money can be better spent to reduce air pollution, create more innovation and economic benefit for the state and create more choices for consumers. That's what the Future Fuels Act will help us to achieve. In short, this bill establishes a standard to reduce the carbon intensity of all transportation fuels supplied in the state at least 20% by 2035. It sets up a system to evaluate all transportation fuels based on full life cycle greenhouse gas, gas assessment. Um, not making conclusions about fuels in general, but evaluating the actual performance of individual fuel producers. It sets up a fuel neutral system and allows the private market to compete to offer both value for consumers and the lowest carbon footprint possible. It directs a rulemaking with clear guidance on the objectives that the legislature wants from the program, uh, calls for stakeholder engagement and multi-agency collaboration. Uh, I recognize, uh, Mr. Chair and members, this is a somewhat complex piece of policy, which is why we've offered a, uh, some informational materials as handouts. We have a Clean Fuels Policy 101 uh, members in your packets, also an announcement of the formation of uh, the Future Fuels Coalition and individual letters of support from a long list of, of supportive organizations. Um, why is there so much support for this policy? It's, it's a tested approach and it's growing in popularity. Policies like this have been in existence for over a decade in other jurisdictions, multiple jurisdictions. We, we know how the programs work. Uh, clean fuel industries are comfortable with them. But no one in the Midwest or in Minnesota would, would be at all interested, I think, in rubber stamping a program from another state. This is why we have facilitated uh, uh, over three years of intense stakeholder dialogue uh, to understand how a program like this could work well for Minnesota and for the Midwest. This led to the announcement of a set of clean fuel policy design principles in January of 2020. Uh, Minnesota stakeholder dialogue uh, followed that with uh, uh, leading up to this announcement today, but also a recommendation by the Governor's Council on Biofuels for a clean fuel policy and as, as Representative Lippert stated, recommendation from the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council. This offers many benefits for Minnesota and I'll, I'll wrap up very, very quickly here, uh, but it's an all of the above approach. It doesn't pick technology winners and losers, offers benefits for consumers and more consumer choice, uh, strong economic benefits for the state as a testimony from Jesse Wyatt shortly will illustrate increases equitable access to transportation, more reliance on Minnesota renewable resources, uh, and I believe would establish Minnesota, reestablish Minnesota as a leader in the production of cleaner fuels. That concludes my testimony, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Jordan. Uh, next, we will be hearing from Tim Sexton with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Mr. Sexton, welcome to the committee. Yeah, thank you, Chair Long and members uh, for the opportunity to share some brief testimony today on behalf of the administration. Uh, for the record, my name is Tim Sexton and I serve as, as an assistant commissioner with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. As you all know, transportation is the number one source of carbon pollution in Minnesota and the United States. And the administration supports the development of a clean fuels policy as an important strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector and meet the goals of the Next Generation Energy Act. A clean fuels policy could reduce carbon pollution from transportation in Minnesota by over 4 million tons by the year 2030 and over 20 million tons by the year 2050. Just for context, 20 million tons would be about half of the total reduction of carbon pollution needed to achieve the state's Next Generation Energy Act goals for the transportation sector. 
The importance of this policy is reflected in recommendations from the Governor's Council on Biofuels, MnDOT's Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council, and the Governor's Climate Change Subcabinet. The Governor's commitment to pursuing a clean fuels policy is seen in MnDOT's request for funding for a stakeholder process to develop the details of such a policy for Minnesota. Engagement is essential to ensure we hear from as many Minnesotans as possible to design a policy that works best for Minnesota and potentially the Midwest in the future. <clears throat> the proposed stakeholder process should be a multi-agency effort that includes the Departments of Agriculture, Commerce, Transportation, and the P Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, private businesses, nonprofits, academia, and elected officials. MnDOT will continue to work with the bill author and other stakeholders moving forward as the conversation continues around the shared goal of arriving at a clean fuels policy that will reduce health and economic disparities uh, currently experienced by low-income communities and people of color and prioritize the creation of new markets for the agricultural sector. Thank you for your work on this important policy and this concludes my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Sexton. Uh, next, we will be hearing from uh, Jesse Wyatt with the Great Plains Institute. Welcome to the committee. Mr. Chair and members, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Jesse Wyatt. I'm an energy planner and analyst with the Great Plains Institute. And today I will be presenting high level economic impact findings for a clean fuels policy in Minnesota. So over the past couple of years, as Brendan alluded, GPI in collaboration with partners has been convening the Midwest Clean Fuels Stakeholder Initiative. A function of that group was to conduct analysis of carbon reduction standards of 10, 15, and 20%. The result of the 15% reduction standard was then used to conduct further economic impact analysis. We utilize the in-plan economic model, which is a model that has um, over 500 economic sectors, which it uses to conduct input-output modeling. And we did so for the two-state region of Minnesota and Iowa. Due to, a comp due to the demand for clean alternative fuels to meet those carbon reductions, we experience increases in production, increased expenditures, and lower cost alternative fuels, all of which contribute to positive economic benefits across the seven dimensions that implant models. Output impacts, which are the total value of product sales or services generated across the local economy, value added, employment, employment income or labor income, as well as state, local, and federal tax revenue. So the first numeric column shows the average annual impact in 2019 US dollars for each of those metrics. The column to the right of that shows the total impact for the 10-year period modeled, which was 2021 to 2030. As you can see, there is robust positive benefit across all of these metrics, calling specific attention to the in excess of 10 billion output impacts seen over the 10-year period, as well as the 125 million in state and local tax revenue. We were also able to understand sector-specific economic impacts of a 15% carbon reduction standard. We see positive economic benefits across all impacted groups, including gasoline users, which is primarily households, um, diesel consumers, which most directly translates to trucking, electricity sales, as well as ethanol, biodiesel, renewable diesel, RNG producers, and biofuel farmers. The column at left again, or the first numeric column, shows the average annual impact across the 10-year period. So that's what you could expect to see on an average yearly basis. And the column at right provides the estimated total impact over that same period to all sectors. In conclusion, when we look at the economic impacts of a 15% carbon reduction standard through a clean fuels policy in Minnesota, we find net positive economic impacts in excess of 10 billion output impacts over the period modeled. And that includes benefits for gasoline fuel consumers or households and diesel consumers. We also saw those net positive impacts across all sectors with consistent annual positive economic impact for the entire portfolio of fuels that we looked at, which included biofuels, other renewable alternative fuels, and electricity, all of which can be produced locally. So thank you, Mr. Chair and members. That concludes my remarks. Thank you, Ms. White. Next, we will hear from Emily Wimberger with the Rhodium Group. Welcome to the committee. Sorry, hello, good morning. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. OK, 
All right, great. My name is Emily Wimberger, and I'm an economist at Rhodium Group, which is an independent research firm whose analyses support decision makers in the public, corporate, and nonprofit sectors. Prior to joining Rhodium, I was the chief economist at the California Air Resources Board, where I worked across climate and air pollution policies, including the low carbon fuel standard in California. My comments today focus on a recent Rhodium Group analysis that highlights the need for a multi-pronged approach to reducing greenhouse gases in the U.S. transportation sector, uh, an approach that includes vehicle electrification, efficiency, and low carbon liquid fuels. Transportation, as we've heard, is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S., accounting for 33% of all emissions in 2019. Looking ahead, we project that 1.6 billion tons of greenhouse gases will come from transportation in 2030. In an analysis that we released in January, we identified transportation pathways to net zero emissions and found that a portfolio of strategies, again, including vehicle electrification across all modes, efficiency improvements, and low carbon fuels is the lowest cost and most likely to succeed in reducing greenhouse gases, improving air quality, and promoting equitable access to clean transportation. Even with aggressive electrification, where more than half of all light duty vehicle sales are electric by 2030 and nearly 90% by 2035, our analysis found that there are still 525 million tons of GHGs remaining in the US transportation sector in 2050, as outlined in this slide. Clean fuels will be needed to close this transportation emissions gap, specifically in hard to electrify modes like aviation and marine. Achieving net zero emissions in 2050 will require aggressive policies to deploy a portfolio of clean fuels, including durable market signals like low carbon or clean fuel standards. We find in our modeling that a combination of advanced biofuels, electrofuels, and carbon neutral fossil fuels can successfully close the transportation emissions gap. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Graham Noyes with the Low Carbon Fuel Coalition. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Long and committee members. Uh, my name is Graham Noyes. I'm the executive director of the Low Carbon Fuels Coalition. Uh, I'm pleased to advise this committee that we're at the beginning of the transition to low carbon fuels and Minnesota stands in a strong position to benefit economically and in terms of jobs uh, as part of that transition. Uh, we see major refineries, including uh, Marathon, Holly Frontier and Phillips 66 uh, announcing the turnover. Uh, of those refineries to, re to renewable diesel production. Uh, and we see now with almost 10 years of experience in California a program with $3 billion uh, in annual credit revenue uh, that is not from appropriations, but is based on the greenhouse gas reductions of fuels, uh, which have been in the neighborhood of 75 million metric tons to date. Uh, this attracts all industry sectors, uh, whether it's uh, solar and wind uh, renewable power sources, uh, auto manufacturers, uh, EV charging stations, EV manufacturers, uh, ethanol, biodiesel, renewable diesel, sustainable aviation fuel, uh, catalyst providers, technology providers. Uh, and because of this program structure, uh, we see a technology neutral approach um, that uses the right technologies uh, for the location. I appreciate the opportunity to present these remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we will be hearing from Tim Ranicki with the Minnesota Biofuels Association. Welcome to the committee. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the com committee. My name is Tim Rudnicki. I do represent the Minnesota Biofuels Association, a nonprofit trade organization for ethanol producers. Uh, we support the Future Fuels Act for several reasons. Uh, Minnesota is a place with an abundant source of biomass, which can be used to um, produce homegrown energy for today and tomorrow. And in fact, the, the Governor's Council on Biofuels recognized the potential for Minnesota to harness uh, this biomass potential and thereby be a national leader in producing a clean transportation fuel, such as renewable ethanol. And we think the Future Fuels Act holds tremendous potential to unleash a wide range of benefits by providing consumers with a cleaner and better value fuel. Uh, furthermore, uh, it would be a way to use the know-how of farmers to further green the supply chain. And lastly, uh, deal with uh, the expansion in reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in Minnesota's transportation sector. So we have some uh, immediate solutions to a, a crisis situation, uh, the, the climate crisis. And uh, uh, this is a great opportunity to take a significant positive step forward in addressing uh, that problem. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Nels Paulson with Conservation Minnesota. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Long and members of the committee. My name is Nels Paulson, and I'm the Policy Director for Conservation Minnesota, a statewide environmental nonprofit organization with members in all 87 counties. Conservation Minnesota is excited to support the Future Fuels Act, and we are grateful to Representative Lippert for authoring legislation that will guide the next chapter for Minnesota's low carbon transportation fuels. As we plan for new low carbon transportation fuels, we are particularly pleased that the Future Fuels Act instructs the relevant agencies to consider the disproportionate burdens different communities face from transportation pollution, and then use that information to craft low carbon fuel policies that will improve air quality and public health in burdened communities and across the state. We are also encouraged to see directives in the Future Fuels Act that will help protect natural lands, enhance environmental integrity, and to utilize low carbon fuel policies to maximize the benefits to the environment and natural resources. Thank you for the opportunity to express Conservation Minnesota's support for the Future Fuels Act. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Steele Lorenz with the Farmers Business Network. Welcome to the committee. Good morning, and, and thank you for having me. Um, I have, uh, uh, my name is Steele Lorenz, head of sustainable business uh, for Farmers Business Network, which is an agriculture technology platform uh, designed to help growers evaluate and understand opportunities for uh, improvement of, of um, return through agronomic and, and economic inputs. Uh, we have been involved in the program uh, since the early days to help uh, understand exactly how growers could participate in this, and the results are quite uh, exciting. Um, our membership base uh, in Minnesota alone is 2,641 farm enterprises, um, and we have been working with them to understand what their current carbon intensity score is and where there is opportunity for improvement. Uh, I'm proud to uh, let this group know that uh, Minnesota growers are in fact the second lowest in carbon intensity of all Midwestern states. And even with this incredible uh, score, there is uh, lots of room for improvement uh, that could be incentivized through this clean field program. Uh, we expect that between 20 and 50% improvements can happen in feedstocks for biofuel across uh, corn ethanol and uh, renewable diesel uh, through the improvement of nitrogen efficiency and the adoption of smart uh, soil healthy uh, technologies, including nitrogen inhibitors uh, and uh, practices, including cover crops and reduction of, of uh, um, tillage. Uh, the grower appeal here is quite strong, and many of our growers are asking for markets to be able to sell their carbon, uh, their low carbon grains into. Um, but the uh, importance here is the opt-in nature of this uh, incentive program, as well as its alignment with healthy soil principles and practices. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Floyd Vergara with the National Biodiesel Board. Welcome to the committee. We have Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Floyd announced he would not actually be available today. Oh, apologies. My apologies. I hadn't uh, gotten that notice. Um, then we will move to uh, Josh Fisher with the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Again, my name is Josh Fisher, and I'm here on behalf of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, and I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, the Alliance for Automotive Innovation represents the auto manufacturers that produce about 99% of all the light-duty vehicles sold in the U.S. We're here in support of, of the uh, clean fuels policy and the implementation of a low carbon fuel standard or an LCFS in the state of Minnesota. The LCFS is an important and necessary policy tool to support the state's goals to reduce transportation related greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the state is undertaking a number of efforts aimed at reducing GHG em emissions because Minnesota has fallen short of its uh, reduction goals. Auto innovators wants to emphasize that the state needs a holistic approach that addresses all sectors and provides complementary measures to support emissions reductions and promote clean technologies. The LCFS is one critical piece of a comprehensive approach to transportation emissions. It makes sure that while automakers are making significant investments uh, to the tune of $250 billion by 2023 in the cleaner, more efficient and electric vehicles, other industries will also be doing their part too. In this case, the fuels used in vehicles and other modes of transportation will also be reducing their carbon intensity as part of a lower carbon future for transportation. And as Minnesota seeks ways to fund electric vehicle investments, an LCFS can and should provide revenues 
a revenue source for EV purchase incentives and charging and hydrogen fueling station uh, development. We urge the committee to support this clean fuels policy and thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, and our, our last uh, testifier on uh, Representative Lippert's list is uh, Jeremy Martin with the Unis Union of Concerned Scientists. Mr. Martin, welcome to the committee. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm the Director of Fuels Policy at the Union of Concerned Scientists. And on behalf of uh, more than 6,800 UCS supporters in Minnesota, I'm in ha enthusiastic in our support for the Future Fuels Act. Uh, the Future Fuels Act takes a science-based approach and measures each fuel based on its full life cycle emissions. This will drive uh, technological development and deployment across a, a wide portfolio of low carbon fuels, including electricity and biofuels. We know that we can't stabilize the climate with petroleum-based transportation fuel, uh, but replacing petroleum is a big job and it requires us to move beyond arguments about biofuels versus electricity and drive progress deployment across all uh, of the low carbon fuel opportunities. By supporting emissions reductions, rather than uh, focusing on increased production, the Future Fuel Act also ensures that clean fuels keep getting cleaner. Electric cars and biofuels are cleaner than gasoline today, uh, but we need electric cars powered primarily by renewable energy, and we need our biofuels to get steadily cleaner with less pollution on the farm and at the biorefinery, and the Future Fuels Act will support this progress. While the overall structure of the act is technology neutral, each fuel pathway is different and we need specific safeguards and policy guidance uh, that's appropriate for each one. Uh, for supporting electrification, it's essential that we design this to benefit all Minnesotans, particularly those underserved and overburdened by today's transportation system. And we also need safeguards to protect natural lands and to ensure that support for farmers is equitable and benefits small and mid-sized farms as well. We look forward to continued engagement with the committee, the legislature, the coalition, and the administration to make the Future Fuels Act a success. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have uh, one uh, public testifier signed up, uh, Peter Wagenius with the Sierra Club. Uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, I'm Peter Wagenius from Sierra Club, and I am a member of the aforementioned Stack Committee. At the heart of this proposal are two assumptions which are now out of date. First, advocates tout that it is technology neutral, which may have been a virtue at one time, but that is no longer a virtue when technologies are obviously not equal. Fully electric vehicles are superior in terms of climate impact as well as air quality and environmental justice. EVs are already significantly less polluting today based on the current electricity supply, which is already greener than in the past. This existing advantage for EVs will only grow as our electric grid continues to improve. By contrast, the other fuels already pollute more than electricity, and they always will. This is not to say there is no role for biofuels in transportation's future, but it should be limited to heavier vehicles where no electric alternative exists. Advocates have acknowledged that the biofuels industry wants this bill to carve out a place for them in the future of transportation. It is understandable they would need government to intervene on their behalf because technology and the free market think General Motors, are currently passing them by. Policy needs to keep up with reality. Second, there is no need for additional rulemaking to accelerate adoption of EVs. That might be needed for reducing carbon in liquid fuels, but we don't need to overthink or bureaucratize EV policy. To accelerate EV adoption, we can incentivize charging stations, incentivize EV purchases, and implement clean cars. Could a low carbon fuel standard be an additional tool worth the time to develop? Theoretically, yes, if we could implement something very much like the California version, where they are in effect taxing big oil to pay for EVs. <laughs> but it is unlikely that the Senate would ever pass, nor the Walls administration would implement that version of a standard. Let me end on a positive. To the extent that this bill serves as a possible alternative to the EV mandate, that is very useful, since ethanol, as currently manufactured, doesn't reduce carbon so much as move it around. It also pollutes drinking water and kills pollinators at great financial cost, all while distracting us from real action on the climate crisis. For that reason, Sierra Club is not opposed to this bill, but we are strongly expressing these concerns, and we thank the authors for bringing forth a possible alternative to the E15 mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilkidius. Uh, we will now turn to uh, member questions, and we will begin with Representative Fornstein. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the testifiers. Thank you to uh, Mr. Wagenius for his testimony as well. 
Um, and I wanted just to point out, um, uh, Mr. Chair and, and members, that we have also uh, spent considerable time in the Transportation Committee this year talking about um, uh, the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector. And I've uh, also very much appreciated uh, uh, Assistant Commissioner Sexton's role in uh, guiding the Stack Committee, which has been referenced uh, several times. That's the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council at MnDOT. And I, I think it's important, uh, Mr. Chair, members to uh, know, note that this uh, strategy, which um, is a good one, uh, is part of a larger uh, set of issues and recommendations. Uh, and I, I want to remind members that, you know, in addition to uh, lowering the carbon footprint of our transportation fuels, uh, this needs to be done in conjunction with other strategies. Uh, I don't want people to uh, be left with uh, the impression that this is the only way to go. It's part of a larger mix. And that mix includes uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled, uh, land use changes that um, have tremendous import in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector, and of course, larger utilization of public transportation. So I hope it um, uh, is uh, noted that uh, this is part of a, a larger strategy, and in fact, uh, some of the other, and of course, electrification of the transportation system and, and cleaner cars. Uh, and that this is one of many tools we can use. And in fact, uh, some of these others uh, uh, can have um, even greater impact than this. So, you know, as we move forward, uh, and I support this bill, uh, Representative Lippert, and thank you for bringing it forward and look forward to a, a conversation in the Transportation Committee about it. Uh, let's keep in mind that this is part of, uh, one part of a, of a much broader strategy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Hornsing. Uh, Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just wanted to, as far as, you know, obviously tomorrow is um, uh, our first deadline. And this bill, I believe, was put to commerce. Am I correct? Uh, Representative Lippert. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Representative Swinsinski, uh It's going to commerce. Representative Swazinski. Well, is it going like today or tomorrow? I mean, technically this, we're not actually even, what was the motion that you made, Chair Long, on this bill? Uh, Representative Swazinski, this is an informational hearing. We don't have the possession of the bill. Representative Swazinski. So is it your thought that this bill will meet a deadline, Mr. Yes, Chair? Yes, Representative Swazinski. It meets deadline how? Because we are having an informational hearing and it is going to the Commerce Committee, which is a finance committee, and it will be referred to the Commerce Committee ahead of deadline. So it meets deadline. So it's at committee. So not that it actually had a hearing. That's correct. It, it needs to have a hearing before the second uh, deadline in the Commerce Committee, which I understand it will. But it needs to have a first hearing, and we're not having a hearing. We're having an informational conversation because we can't amend this bill currently. Representative Swazinski, uh, the bill meets first deadline by being referred to a finance committee and it is being referred to a finance committee. Okay. Mr. Chair, and then I just have general questions. Representative um, Swazinski. Thank you. Um, so to the first testifier, uh, they spoke to, I forget what your name is, I spoke to you yesterday, sir. Um, you spoke a little bit that uh, this is a better option than putting uh, people from another state in charge of our climate goals. Was that uh, a, a conversation about the uh, California initiative? And then how does this bill uh, interact with that potential uh, moving forward uh, through rulemaking through MPCA? I'll, I'll anyone that wants Mr. to answer that. Mr. Jordan looks like wants to take a crack at that. Mr. Jordan. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Swazinski, uh, Brendan Jordan with the Great Plains Institute. Uh, there are clean fuel policies in other states, but the, the recommendation by the Future Fuels Coalition is to create a unique Minnesota version of this program. Uh, we can certainly learn from other states uh, and other jurisdictions that California is one of them, uh, Oregon, uh, there's also bills underway in, in New Mexico, Washington, 
New York State, the province of British Columbia. So there's a lot of models out there we can look at, but I just want to be clear that this is not uh, this is not binding Minnesota in any way to uh, you know any other states. Uh, rules. This would be if Minnesota finds something good that another state's done that we want to adopt, we're we're free to do so. Representative Swazinski, do you have a follow up? Yes, but how will this just it can be to anyone? Um, how will this react? So let's say we're for some reason the state of Minnesota would move forward uh, with the California mandates uh, and what they do there by putting them in charge of our policies. How will this interact with that? These are two things that are moving forward. Uh, Chair uh, Hornstein talked about this is just one part of a mix. How will this react with those other things that are potentially going to be happening? Mr. Jordan. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Swinzinski, th this is has no connection with, I know the name sounds similar because it has clean at the beginning, but it really has no connection to clean cars. Uh, clean cars is is a whole separate thing. This is not not related. It doesn't draw on, you know, it's this connection with the Clean Air Act and California's regulatory authority. This is this would only any authority to administer this would derive only from you know Minnesota's own unique statutory authority. Uh, one yeah, more just, question, Representative Swazinski, and then we'll have to move on. We have several hands. We you know you had a lot of folks testify on the need for this. Um, from a scientific basis. And I've asked this question before, I've never gotten an answer back. You know, if we pass this, one, how will it react to border communities? So like I represent a district along the border um, and sometimes we'll buy fuel from Minnesota, sometimes we'll buy fuel from South Dakota and have it trucked in just because of a, it's maybe a better deal across the border. Um, how will this react potentially with border communities, with farmers, with, purchasing fuel with truckers um, that might be just passing through the state uh, from the petroleum retailers perspective. Um, and then also uh, we're told that this will not raise cost on fuels. So how does that work? I mean, Rep Representative Lippert, did you want to take that? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Swinzinski. Um, you know, I Thinking in terms of, of agriculture, um, so you know, if, as an ethanol plant's drawing from farmers or contracting with farmers, uh, you know, one place where this this policy would interact is, um, you know, the ethanol plant might uh, have the, the farmers within that within its area be implementing more soil health practices, leading to a cleaner cleaner score for its ethanol um, as it's, and that that might cross uh, might cross state lines. Um, otherwise, the focus of this policy is really just to drive cleaner and cleaner fuels, uh, both uh, drive cleaner fuels within biofuels and cleaner fuels within uh, or, or towards more electrification as well. So it's focused on emissions, um, and that's that's a primary piece. And, and Brendan Jordan may have uh, more to respond to your question. Mr. Jordan. Um Mr. Chair, Representative Swazinski, you know, the, the challenge today with clean fuels is that there are massive barriers to entry in the marketplace. It's it's pretty common. If you if you can find a gas station that sells, for example, higher blends of ethanol, you'll often find that the higher blends are, are quite a bit cheaper. Um, but but it's hard for consumers to access those things. That's true for a whole variety of cleaner fuels. Uh, you know, I think that you know, to the extent that this helps support access to the market, I, I think you you might have a border dynamic of people crossing the border to Minnesota to access uh, the more you know increased consumer availability of clean fuels in our state. Uh, from a retail perspective, we I, I assume that there's people are still going to need to go to refueling stations, and uh, um, you know, so I, I think that you know this actually creates some opportunity some uh, opportunity for new investment and incentives for new investment in uh, offering, you know, things like electric vehicle charging, higher blends of biofuels at those retailers. So I, I think it's a positive. So uh, we have four hands and we have uh, just a few more minutes left. So if members could please keep their questions short and responses short, then hopefully we can get to everybody. Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Chair Horsing kind of mentioned this a little bit uh, I think this uh, question is for Mr. Waginius, who's uh, identified himself as a member of the stack. 
Uh, could Mr. Wagini uh, explain what is the stack and what were some of the other recommendations that they had? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure, uh, Mr. Wagini. Uh, thank you, Representative Lee, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am a member of the stack. It made three rec uh, uh, It consists of 17 people uh, convened by uh, Transportation Commissioner uh, Kelleher and, and co-chaired by um, Chris Clark of Excel Energy. It made three recommendations on reducing vehicle miles traveled, as well as three recommendations on repowering, each of which were approved as a package, six in total. I wanna to clarify that they were not ranked. Considerable concern was expressed about this proposal and its relationship to ethanol, but to vote no on it, stack members would have had to also vote no on EV charging infrastructure and incentives to purchase EVs, which were very broadly supported. I'd be happy to speak to any of the other recommendations, but to reinforce Representative Hornstein's comment, I would call your attention to just one. Uh, the recommendation of the uh, VMT group was that the state adopt a, a, a goal to reduce vehicle miles traveled by 20%. As much as you can hear that we are advocates of electrification, uh, there is no data to support the idea that we could meet our goals in the transportation sector uh, through electrification alone. Electrification alone should not be thought of as a silver bullet. Uh, reduce it, giving people alternatives choices to get around so that they don't have to drive everywhere is an essential component to meeting our climate goals. Again, I'd be happy to speak to the other uh, recommendations, and I hope that all six recommendations of the stack are advanced by MnDOT to the legislature for thorough discussion. Good, good topic for discussion for another hearing. Uh, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the testifiers, too. This is an interesting discussion. I have a ethanol plant in my district, by the way, and from all counts that I've seen, it's run very well. But one of the concerns that they brought up, uh, and they tend to be hassled by the MPCA quite a bit, they're not fans, but maybe nobody is a fan of the MPCA, uh, is the uh, groundwater effect. Now, I know the ethanol, the people who run the ethanol plants say they use much less groundwater than they used to, is the information I received. but. It seems like the MPCA is very concerned about the overusage of uh, groundwater uh, to the point where we're depleting it in some areas uh, or the potential to deplete. Uh, does any of the testifiers have an update on that in any way? I mean, where's the MPCA on that? Is the groundwater uh, reserve and replenishing still a concern in terms of expanding the ethanol uh, base in the state? Representative Lippert. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Grunhagen. I know um, uh, reuse of water, conservation of water with, is, is a topic of concern uh, within the ethanol industry. I don't know if uh, Brendan Jordan has, has a response to this or other testifiers. Mr. Jordan. Uh, Mr. Chair and Re Representative, I, I, I might uh, uh, phone a friend here and, and ask if uh, Mr. Rudnicki with the Minnesota Biofuels Association might have a, an answer to that question. Uh, Mr. Rudnicki. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Grunhagen, um, I, I, I know that uh, certainly inputs are used for uh, making solar arrays and for producing petroleum and for making ethanol. And I think there are a number of statements uh, that were made during this hearing that uh, might uh, need some further factual clarification. And uh, without going into a lot of detail, but responding to the water question, uh, typically what we see is the appropriation permits from the Department of Natural Resources, at least in the case of the producers I represent, are, are probably double what's actually used. And what's rather significant in the ethanol industry today, not 1990 or not 2000, but in 2021, is again, the, the producers I represent in the industry are, are really keen on reusing water. In fact, um, many of them are actually capturing storm water from their facility site and using that. Uh, the idea of reuse is key. And, and what's really significant here, Representative, is that there's a drive and this clean fuels policy initiative can help even further advance technological innovation. The intent is to drive the carbon index lower. And as you heard from some of the subject matter experts here today, um, reducing inputs, greening the supply chain is how we make a cleaner fuel. 
And that actually has a better value for consumers. It's better for the environment because we're using fewer inputs. And, and again, this is, I think what some of the other uh, representatives noted, Representative Hornstein, is that this is actually part of a solution to a very big problem. It's not the total solution, but any of us, if we just look out our window, we'll see lots of vehicles with internal combustion engines. The cleaner the fuel, the lower the carbon fuel, the better value for the consumer, and we begin reducing greenhouse gas emissions today. And, and the reality is this is how you deal with the rolling stock that's on the highway today. And there's no question, if you walk, bike, use public transit, and then use a biofuel in your internal combustion engine, you're doing something significant today to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I'd be happy to provide more technical detail uh, in written uh, form if that would be helpful to you and, and the rest of the committee members. So we're running, um, Rep Rep yep. Representative Grunhagen, we have two more questions and we're out of time. I was hoping to slip just, in the other two questions. I just think the impact to our groundwater needs to be a, a mix in this discussion, okay? Because it is a concern that's been brought up by other constituents in my area. And uh, I think we need to use it in a way that it can be replenished. So I'm just throwing that out for food for thought. Okay, thank, thank you, Representative Grunhagen. Uh, Representative Vigo and Bo, if, if you could keep it to 30 seconds and one question, I can slip you in. Uh, Representative Vigo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, you know, my question was, was one that wasn't answered during the presentation. I'm hoping I can get a quick answer now. Um, my, my district and my constituents, we love our 1990s pickups. We love our old two-stroke motors. We love our four-wheelers. We love our snowmobiles. These new fuels, these new ideas, they don't work in these older engines. And I guess my big concern is here is if we push forward a mandate like this, that we're going to see these fuels be unable to be used on these vehicles and these um, ATVs and these motors that me and my constituents love to enjoy as well as the rest of greater Minnesota. And I think what we're going to have to do is going to force a future cost on my constituents that who are right now recovering from a pandemic that having to buy new motors or new vehicles is not what they want to do. They want to drive their 1990s F-150 that they can work on in their driveway. And I'm really afraid that a mandate like this policy would take that away from them. So that is my concern with this legislation. Thank Representative you. Representative Lippert. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, er, and thank you, Representative Igo. Uh, we're in we're in a time of, of tremendous technological change, and um, it's really exciting. New technologies are emerging, and and that has appeal. Um, and we're going to see those technologies um, um, in you know in more and more of our communities. And I think um, you know we we do know we need a to be transitioning towards electrification, biofuels can help with that. Uh, biofuels are able to be used broadly. Um, and so I think we're gonna see a part of this, uh, this policy is that it helps us with that transition, helps us uh, speed that transition. So I think this can be part of the solution. And I'd also just note Representative Lippert, I believe this is a 20% requirement in 2035. So there's a, a lot of transition time and, and it's not the entirety of the fuel stock. Um, That's correct, Mr. Chair. Representative Bull. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I had three questions. I'll, I'll go with one just because, you. like you say, time is tough. I did want to quickly say, Representative Igo, I hear you. I love muscle cars, and, and a lot of my friends do, and so, you know, I, I worry about that. But my question is, what's the path for this bill? What, is, it, is it going to be going through, like, environment and transportation, or what kind of committee, what's the path for that? Representative Lippert. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Representative Bo. Uh, it'll be uh, have a hearing in commerce, have a hearing in transportation, uh, for sure. So it's going to have a busy, uh, busy few weeks. Thank, Thank you, you, Representative Lippert. So with that, um, Representative Lippert, any closing comments to your bill? I just uh, thank everyone for the discussion today. Uh, this is, we need many policies to be addressing our climate crisis, but I think it's clear that this uh, can be one central policy for uh, reducing emissions in the transportation sector. And I look forward to the conversation and other committees. Thank you so much, Representative Lippert. Uh, next, we will be hearing uh, Representative Holland's bill, House File 1647. Uh, Representative Hollins, would you like to move your bill? Had to find the unmute button. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, I would like to move that House File 1647 be recommended to be placed on the general register, I believe. I think we're, I think um, we're laying this over for do possible have inclusion, if that. That Are we laying it over for inclusion? Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Let me change no, no my problem. motion. Thank um, you, Representative Hollins. <laughs> Representative Hollins moves that House File 1647 be laid over for possible inclusion. And, and you have an author's amendment, I believe. 
That's correct. Yes, I would like to. Um, I would like to offer that amendment. Representative, and I can Holland. tell you what it does if you want. But absolutely, Representative Hollins moves the A one uh, to get the bill in the shape you would like. If you'd like to describe your amendment, it, it's really. It, it's nothing substantive. It's just tightening up the language and making sure that it conforms with um, the desires of the uh, tribal organizations as well as the um, Department of Commerce. Any discussion to the A1? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. The A1 is adopted. Representative Hollins, please tell us about your bill. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee members. Um, the this bill is um, it's fairly simple. I will say the eleven tribal governments that share geography with the state of Minnesota have identified a critical need to be energy independent to provide alternative options for tribal members um, to reduce the energy burden of tribal members and to create clean and um, clean and energy efficient future for the generations to come. And so what this bill really does is it codifies the current practices of the Department of Commerce, uh, where the department um, will be required to actively support and assist the 11 tribal nations um, with the establishment and operation of tribal energy advocacy councils. Um, I have two testifiers today. I have. Um, uh, Mr. President, uh, sorry, President Larson, who's the president of the Lower Sioux Indian Community and chair of MIAC. Um, and I would love him to walk through the um, need for the proposal and MIAC support. President Larson, welcome to the committee. Good morning and thank you, Chair Long and members. Um, I'll be as brief as I can. I know you're busy, but I thank you for the time. Um, I am Robert Larson, president of the Lower Sioux Indian Community here, Southwest Minnesota. I also chair the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, which represents the, the 11 tribes in the state of Minnesota. I'm here in support of House File 1647. And the reasons I am here, uh, the Community Energy Program Statute uh, 216C.381 allows for Indian tribal government officials, as well as other interest, interested parties, a seat to develop and implement community-based energy programs. The Department of Commerce recent consultation with the tribal nations revealed that energy is a huge area of interest, as well as concern for the tribes. As caretakers of Minnesota, the land, the reduction of greenhouse gases, carbon reduction, climate change, and sustainable and renewable energy, as well as the protection of Mother Earth are of utmost importance. Also of importance for the tribes and members of tribes is having access to funding for energy so the people do not get disconnected or dwell in less than ideal conditions. Tribes have ideas and strategies on how to accomplish these things in conservation, access to funding, et cetera. And it would be ideal for tribes to form their own energy council. Uh, with sovereign status and the unique status of tribes, it makes sense that with the members of the CEP, including cities, counties, and other businesses and organizations, why not the tribes? Tribal Energy Council would con connect the tribes with one another to share ideas, resources, hold conversations, strategies, and possibly tribal utility commissions all around energy. Commerce would help to support the Tribal Energy Council through technical assistance, sharing information and resources such as granting opportunities. And this is another chance, opportunity for another great tribal and state partnership. On November 12, 2020, MIAC did pass a resolution in support of a tribal energy council. And as always, we look towards the future, our future generations to come and try to make the best decisions based on that for them. So I thank you for your time and consideration and this concludes my testimony. Thank you so much for being with us. 
And next we are hearing from uh, Temporary Commissioner Grace Arnold with the Department of Commerce. Welcome, Temporary Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Long and members for the opportunity to be here uh, today. My name is Grace Arnold and for the record, I'm the Temporary Commissioner of the Department of Commerce. So I'd first like to thank Representative Hollins for authoring this proposal and uh, thank you, President Larson, for um, presenting the bill. I think, um, you know, President Larson articulated what we've heard in the past two years of consultations with the department that, um, you know, tribes are really interested in a lot of the area, the, the different topics that come up in the energy area and a, a venue to, um, you know, to discuss those and to be able to, um, you know, sort of think through many of those issues from a tribal perspective was really needed. So the idea is based on the Advocacy Council for Tribal Transportation, um, in which tribes lead coordination with the Department of Transportation. We sort of took that idea that's been very successful um, and uh, we, with the, <laughs> with the tribal government, governments, and, um, and uh, thought that that might be a, a good model um, for uh, something with an energy focus. Under this proposal, Commerce would provide staff support and subject matter expertise to the tribal governments as they discuss, discuss energy options and issues facing the tribal nations. I do want to stress that this proposal does not require tribes to organize or engage. But it and it would be a tribally led effort. Commerce's role would be supportive. So again, uh, thank you, Chair Long. Thank you, Representative Hollins, um, for having us here today and for authoring the bill. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. We will uh, turn to member questions. I don't see any hands, but I'll give it a second. Okay, seeing no hands, uh, Representative Hollins, would any closing remarks to your bill? Um, just really quickly, I would like to thank the testifiers, thank the committee members for hearing this. Um, I thank you for allowing me to be a part of this legislation. Um, you know, the, to me, this is where where equity uh, intersects with climate, and I'm all about it. I'm really excited to to be helping to support this. So, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Representative Hollins. Representative Hollins renews her motion that House File 1647, as amended, be laid over. Uh, next, we will be turning to uh, my bill, and I will um, be uh, turning the gavel over to Representative Acom to chair. Thanks, Representative Long. Um, so, um, Representative Long moves House File 1987 to be laid over for possible inclusion. Mr. Representative Long, would you like to tell us about your bill? Uh, absolutely. I, I will be very brief, as I'd like to. Uh, allow time for my uh, testifiers to to present. Um, so we have discussed in this committee how important building emissions are to reaching our overall greenhouse gas goals as a state. We know that we're not on track to meet them right now. We know that they are 40% of the overall greenhouse gas emissions uh, as a state. We heard a bill to deal with new commercial buildings earlier in the session. And uh, this is a, a proposal that uh, Governor Walls has included as part of his uh, clean energy uh, package proposal for this session to set a goal for existing commercial and residential buildings to reduce their energy usage by 50 percent uh, through 20 by, by 50 percent by 2035. Uh, it's a proposal I'm, I'm really excited to support. We I think need to set goals and hold ourselves to them if we want to stay on track to meet our greenhouse gas emissions as a state and this is an important step for helping us figure out as a state how we're going to be reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the building sector. Uh, and with that, I would love to um, turn it over to um, uh, Temporary Commissioner Arnold. Welcome to the committee. Welcome back to the committee, um, Commissioner Arnold. Please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Jerry Gum and members. Uh, for the record, I'm Grace Arnold and I'm the Temporary Commissioner for the Department of Commerce. So I first like to thank Chair Long for authoring this important pro proposal. Uh, as Chair Long mentioned uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago by now, um, you, you heard about um, Minnesota's progress towards the, the greenhouse gas goals established in the Next Generation Energy Act, and you also heard meeting those goals. So House File 1987 adds a goal to reduce existing commercial residential buildings, energy use by 50%, commercial and residential buildings use by 50% to 50, by 50% by 2035. I cannot talk today, I apologize. 
through the continuation of the most effective current energy savings incentives programs and through the development of new programs strategically prioritizing solutions with the highest overall carbon reduction. I'll remind you that Minnesota already has a, a, a building energy code for new construction, but there's no clear goal for existing buildings for energy efficiency. And that leaves a large footprint of buildings that are untouched by greenhouse gas goals um, and the, the resulting emissions. This change will provide a foundation for benchmarking and comparing existing programs for energy efficiency based on their effectiveness. These activities will generate investments in energy efficiency in existing buildings, saving money for Minnesotans and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The statutory goal is aimed at providing an ambitious target for the building and construction industry and creating jobs in development and deployment of new building technologies. The goal will enable energy independence and security by relying less on out-of-state energy imports. So I'll close by thanking you again, Chair Long and uh, Chair, Chair Acom and Representative Long in this particular case, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Arnold. Representative Long, would you like to introduce your next testifier? Yes, I'd like to welcome uh, Michael Noble with Fresh Energy. Welcome to the committee, Mike, Mr. Noble. Um, introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Long. Um, um, members of the committee, my name is Michael Noble. I'm the Executive Director of Fresh Energy, a nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit, uh, public interest organization advocating for carbon neutral economies. We're e extremely happy to help present uh, House File uh, 1987 the administration's bill to establish energy saving goals for existing buildings. I'll be very, very brief and just uh, enthusiastically remind everyone that energy efficiency in existing buildings creates um, many, many benefits. We're renewing and modernizing our building stock, uh, making it more durable and long lasting. We're making buildings more comfortable and more affordable for the people and the businesses who occupy them. We're making buildings more secure and more resilient and able to uh, get through severe weather events, extreme cold events, extreme heat events. And of course, uh, we're cutting carbon emissions affordably, uh, every bit as important as our efforts to cut carbon emissions in the power sector and in the transportation sector. And I just want to conclude by uh, reminding everyone that these jobs and these industries are local jobs and local industries. Uh, not to uh, be uh, too flippant, but you can't export a building to China, have it weatherized and ship it back. These are all 100% local industries, 100% local jobs, uh, engineering jobs, heating and ventilating jobs, construction jobs, insulation jobs. These create family supporting wages in the building trades, pipe fitters and laborers, electrical workers, sheet metal workers. None of these industry or jobs can be outsourced. All of these are local industries. And we have many wonderful Minnesota companies that um, are excel in this area, both in the nonprofit sector and the private sector and the Fortune 500 group. Uh, one of my favorite I might just throw out is a, a small company started it in Mankato, Minnesota, 75F, which has attracted investment from the um, Bill Gates and from other global uh, climate uh, venture funds, uh, scaling up to dramatically cut uh, energy use in buildings through software and engineering and um, building controls. So that's just one small example of the exciting kind of companies that can be uh, advanced uh, and the industries and jobs that can be advanced by setting and then um, implementing a statewide goal to cut energy use in buildings by half. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Nobles. Um, with that, we'll turn to um, discussion and uh, member questions. I think first up was Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this question could be the, to the commissioner. Um, what is your enforcement arm ideas for this? So let's say there's a building out of compliance um, and how will this be paid? Will the Department of Commerce actually pay companies to retrofit their buildings or do they have to uh, you know, raise their costs of production or how will this get paid for? Um, I mean, if the state's willing to just mandate it and then pay for it, uh, that's, that's one thing, but then how does that, I mean, what's the budget item and how much is the ask? Um, let's see, uh, Commissioner Arnold, would you like to take that? Thank you, Chair Acom and Representative Swazinski. This is a goal, so not a mandate. 
And uh, so that allows us to kind of shape our policy and the programs that we have with the goal in mind, but there's no fiscal cost and no economic, the economic impact is not sort of as you describe as a mandate. So Madam Chair. Please go ahead. So my thought is that, you know, when you say that, well, this is just going to be a goal so that you can make rules then to enforce it. So we don't know exactly what your, you have a rough idea of what your plans are to enforce, to kind of help uh, gain compliance to this goal. Commissioner Arnold. Arnold. Chair Aikum, Representative Swazinski. Again, it, the, enforcement, the enforcement isn't sort of in the bucket of goal setting. It's it's an aspirational and sort of sets a target. So um, we have, you know, enforcement portions of, of the department and in cases where we have statute that allows for it, we enforce this, but that wouldn't be a part of this, um, this proposal. Thank you, Commissioner. And then just Arnold. one final thing, Madam Chair. Representative Sosinski. And then just, you know, oft oftentimes we hear in this committee, especially, um, what c starts off as a goal will become a mandate. Do you have a timeline uh, that you wish to follow um, or maybe some of the advocates, um, like maybe it's three years, two years, four years uh, that we want to kind of turn this kind of lighthearted uh, goal into a mandate. Commissioner Arnold. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Representative Swasinski. No. Representative Long, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Sure. I, I was just going to stress that uh, climate change is not a lighthearted matter that the uh, you know, the health and safety of our communities uh, is serious and setting goals is serious, but this is this is simply a way to measure our progress, which is what we did with the Next Generation Energy Act. And I think the reports that we've seen from that help us try to uh, solve pro policy problems here at the legislature, but uh, this is trying to track our progress against the goal and that's, that's really it. Representative Franzen, do you have a question? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So I'm just curious, will existing buildings have to meet current code before they can be sold? Representative Long, did you want to address that? I, I, yeah, I think I heard the question, um, but if I if I didn't get it correct, Representative Franzen will correct me. Uh, <laughs> so it, the question I heard was, will existing buildings have to meet a standard before they can be sold? Uh, right. As, as uh, I think Commissioner Arnold mentioned, this is not a standard. This is not a requirement. This is a goal. Uh, and so there is no requirement in here for existing buildings to meet. So this is really just trying to help us stay on track for meeting our greenhouse gas goals as a state for one of the most important sectors of energy um, emissions. Representative Franzen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Long, um, so if there's no stick, what would incentivize for those to meet the goals that you have. Representative Long. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of confusion about uh, what a goal is. Um, and a goal is trying to set out uh, where we want to get to as a state. So it is not an enforcement, it is not a stick. Uh, there are other policies that can help us get to those goals, but the, the purpose of measuring goals is that you uh, are able to uh, see as a state whether you're on track to trying to achieve something that we value. And in this case, we're saying that we value reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the building sector, and that's something we wanna measure. Representative Franzen. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, we've got Representative Bo. I think you're next. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. You know, I, you might wanna put me on the list of folks who are confused, and so it may be an easy easy answer, but as I, as I hear the discussion on goals and mandates, I just, I can't help but think, affordable housing and, and older housing stock. And will this in any way in, inhibit folks from selling older housing stock without having to put a lot of money into to meet some sort of a new code that comes along and, and therefore kind of uh, reduce the ability to have affordable housing stock? Representative Long. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm glad you brought up affordability. Energy costs are, are the second largest cost for owning a home after paying the mortgage uh, for most homeowners. And so, Having a more efficient uh, building is a benefit to uh, homeowners, and having a more efficient building stock are, are benefits to you know Minnesotans as a whole. 
But as I said, this bill is not a building code. Representative Bo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it, it's true, you know, uh, energy costs are a big part of it, but boy, if you can't afford to buy that house in the first place, you never get a chance to find out if you can pay that energy bill or not. I didn't hear a question there. Uh, I, I guess there wasn't. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Representative Bo. Um, last we have up, Representative Meckland. So I'll chuckle on to the last one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, um, sorry. To, to the author, um, you know, as someone who does, you know, a big part of our, our building code uh, focuses heavily on energy uh, efficiency. In fact, it's required in our continuing ed that that has to be a significant portion of our, our continuing ed on an annual basis. Um, and, and yes, our homes have become far more energy efficient uh, uh, in the last, uh, what, 20 years, I guess. Um, but that also comes with a cost. It comes with uh, an environmental impact we, you know we, we some of the technology right now that we're seeing is basically a double wall exterior wall so we can improve reduce thermal transfer but also increase insulation and insulating but that comes at the cost of a, a lot more framing members which is a lot more trees um, secondly uh, as we've built them tight and ventilate them right is the building motto uh, we also have found that the air quality inside of these highly efficient residential homes uh, is is very subpar. In fact, it's 70 to 80 times worse than the outside ambient air as far as health quality goes. Um, and that's the challenge we have with making sure that we're keeping the interior envelope of these structures uh, as healthy as we possibly can, which is a never ending challenge as we tighten them up further and further. So I'm wondering since this, and I get it, it's a goal. I've heard you loud and clear on that one, but the, and I do also understand the other side, we, we, we create a goal which slowly filtered its way into recommendations and then into you know, becomes part of a mandate or a rulemaking process somewhere. Um, I guess my question is this, with all that set up, have you discussed at all with code development and the Department of Labor at all, by chance? Representative Long. Um, I can certainly defer to Commissioner Arnold, but uh, as, I, as I mentioned, this is, this is not a code. Uh, and you, you did bring up the importance of indoor air, which is important, but that's solvable. That's something that we can builders know how to do they know how to make sure that we have good indoor air as we're uh, improving insulation uh, representative you, Meckland? yes I'm sure um well I, i'll tell you uh representative long um since we started building tight and ventilating right or the air quality continues to get worse so we have to keep adding you know being more innovative as we go forward with there's some things out now but they're they're new and so hopefully that will uh, but, losing you a little um, bit there. You know, if you, if you just simply look at, uh, yeah, my internet's pretty sketchy. Um, if you just simply look at that when building tight and ventilating right code, it was implemented and look at the sales of the antihistamine drug since, which is Claritin and Allegra have skyrocketed. And there's a reason for it because they co-mingle due to air quality. So I'll just leave it at that. And thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Meckland. Um, Representative Long, sure. do you have any final comments? Of Oh, sure, I'm sorry. if I could just respond briefly, I, I was a question about working with um, uh, between the agencies and I can assure um, Res Representative Mecklen that we are working closely um, with other agencies through the climate change sub cabinet and again, this is a goal, not a standard and, and it's not part of the building code so, um, you know, th this is something that we are working with our, uh, our sister agencies on and um, are uh, very in tune um, and, and working together toward, toward shared goals. Thank you, Commissioner Arnold. Representative Long, any final comments about your bill? I uh, thank uh, Governor Walls for uh, his leadership on this proposal and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing it enacted. With that, Representative Long renews his um, mo motion for the bill to be laid over for possible inclusion. And with that, I will hand the gavel back to Representative, to Chair Long. Thank you, Representative Acom. Our uh, final bill on the agenda for today is uh, Representative Holland's bill uh, dealing with energy storage. Representative Hollins, please tell us about your bill. Thank you so much again, Chair, <laughs> um, Chair Long and, and committee members. This is a bill um, that has to do with energy storage systems. So um, I think most of us know energy storage is a really critical aspect of addressing climate change and moving to 100% clean energy. 
Um, as many of our colleagues on this committee have pointed out, the sun isn't always shining and the wind isn't always blowing and you can't flip a switch to turn on more sun or more wind. Um, and that's really where energy storage comes in. Uh, the deployment of energy storage could overcome um, the biggest obstacle to renewable energy, which is cycling between oversupply when the sun is shining, the wind is blowing, or a shortage when the sun sets or the wind drops. Um, and by smoothing out those imbalances um, between supply and demand, we could eventually replace fossil fuel plants that have to kick in for at least a couple hours a day when energy demands peak. Um, so energy storage is really key to expanding the reach of renewables and speeding the transition to a carbon-free power grid. Um, so I think as most of you know, in 2019, um, a provision was enacted with language requiring utilities to provide an analysis of how energy storage might fit into their future portfolio as a part of their IRP. Um, this bill directs PUC to use that analysis um, to um, direct utility companies to install one or more energy storage systems, um, provided that the commission finds that such investments are reasonable and prudent and in the public interest. Uh, no later than one year following the commission's order um, in an integrated uh, resource plan, the utility must submit an application to the commission for review and approval to install one or more energy storage systems who aggregate capacity meter exceed the or that which was ordered by the commission. Um, I've met with and worked with several utility companies to work on this language and identify how we can best push energy storage goals forward uh, without being unduly burdensome, burdensome on utility companies. And I'll, I'm still in communication with stakeholders on the specifics of the language, but I do have two testifiers here to speak on the proposed bill. Uh, terrific. I think the first testifier is uh, Ellen Anderson. Welcome back to the committee. Oops, sorry. I just clicked off my notes. Okay, good morning. Let me get it not in front of my camera. Good morning. Thank you so much, Chair Long and Representative Hollins and the committee for the opportunity to testify today about the energy storage bill. I'm Ellen Anderson, and I'm testifying on behalf of MCEA, a nonprofit organization with almost 50 years of experience using law and science to protect Minnesota's environment. As climate program director, my focus is on climate solutions and a clean energy transition. But we support this bill because, as Representative Holland said, we see energy storage as an essential tool to advance our energy transition and ultimately to get to a decarbonized electricity system. We have the technology and know-how to achieve a reliable, affordable, and carbon-free grid. If we also electrify much of the transportation, buildings, and industrial sectors, we can achieve our goals in the Next Generation Energy Act of greenhouse gas reductions and to do our share to reduce the most dangerous impacts of climate change. Looking back to my time a long time ago in the State Senate, about 20 years ago, <laughs> I remember when pushing for rene more renewable energy policy, um, we used to say that uh, energy storage was really the holy grail that we needed to make uh, renewable energy viable and to build it out. Because of course, when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining, wind and solar, we still need them to provide dispatchable power 24 seven. So that is still true. But since that time 20 years ago, we've learned so much about what else energy storage can do and the services it can provide. So I'm gonna give you a little list of some of my top reasons why energy storage I think is essential um, and why we think this bill is so important. So um, as I mentioned, energy storage can maximize the value of renewable energy. It stores excess power when it's not needed and injecting, injects it into the grid at peak times. We know as the technology will develop, battery storage will also be able to store electricity for longer periods of time. And in the upper Midwest, we have an abundance of low cost wind, solar and hydropower resources and energy storage will help us capture and deploy that billion some dollar asset and get us to a clean energy grid. But energy storage is also crucial for modernizing and decarbonizing the electricity grid. The legacy grid that we have is based on traditional fossil fuel plants, as you know. They are not very, they're good at some things. They're reliable. 
um, but they're not good at ramping up and down as demand for electricity fluctuates and they tend to be overbuilt as a, as a consequence and inefficient and polluting and expensive to run. And as we're transitioning to clean energy renewable resources spread across a large geography of the region, large scale storage will play a key role. It is very fast responding. It can almost instantaneously level out fluctuations in supply and demand as well as improve power quality, which is essential for our economy, and to regulate frequency and provide uninterruptible power for critical infrastructure. Um, another, uh, another reason energy storage is so important is it can directly be used to cut carbon emissions by replacing polluting combustion turbine plants, which are used to meet peak demand on the hottest days of the year. And for example, some utilities are actually replacing peaker plants, which are quite polluting, with a combination of solar and batteries, and it can store that excess power and dispatch it immediately at peak times. In Colorado, XL Energy closed two, two coal units recently and replaced them with uh, 1,800 megawatts of wind and solar plus battery storage, saving ratepayers hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, energy storage can also help solve transmission constraints. And this is something that is a big issue. I don't know if the committee has spent time on it. You probably have. But um, right now, there is a very long waiting list for wind and solar projects in the whole MISO region. The interconnection process and the transmission capacity are in danger of limiting the expansion of low cost wind and solar. And those are essential for us to meet our climate goals. Um, so. If you use battery storage resources, you can strategically site them to reduce or even eliminate interconnection upgrade costs in many cases. Um, besides that, building new transmission lines takes years and can face a lot of local opposition. So battery storage systems alternatively can be deployed very quickly and with less controversy. A couple of the examples of how battery storage can help allay transmission constraints in a rural area, if you co-locate a battery um, near the renewable energy generating resource, it can charge it up and hold on to that energy while the constraint exists on the transmission system. And then when the peak power goes down, um, it can be later injected into the grid when the peaking constraint is not present, so it doesn't overload the transmission system. And because periods of very high renewable output are not typically sustained for long periods of time, even short duration batteries like most of the lithium ion batteries we have now can significantly reduce the amount of transmission upgrades that are needed. And um, we need these, as I said, to, to interconnect new wind and solar resources. Um, and finally, for aging transmission infrastructure, Batteries can also instantly regulate the power flow and voltage and potentially prevent overload, stability concerns, or other reliability concerns that, again, would trigger a need for costly transmission upgrades. And then, um, hopefully I'm talking fast enough, just a few more comments. The last main um, topic I want to say about why storage is so important to our climate goals is resiliency. And this is more about weathering and bouncing back from the impacts of climate change. And we know that um, we are facing extreme weather events all over the country and they're getting more extreme and they include floods, ice storms, extreme heat and other events. And we're all subject to those and we have experienced those in Minnesota and many of them can trigger energy outages um, as we saw in Texas recently and in many other places locally and it can leave people without access to power. And you can use a lot of um, battery tied projects to help provide more easily accessed resiliency um, power. I'll give you a small example. Uh, one of my, we're gonna have me? To wrap up if you don't mind. Just so we have I will wrap up. Okay, resiliency. I'll just jump to my conclusion. We need this bill because utilities are often slow to adopt new technologies. And that has been unfortunately true in Minnesota with energy storage. In our experience with integrated resource plans, it's typical for utilities to propose conventional fuel resources. And the traditional modeling software that we've been using for years aren't equipped to really evaluate 
the value that storage can provide. But luckily that's changing and better software will now help the Public Utilities Commission understand what other resources can be used to substitute for, for fossil fuel resources at um, a, a comparable or even lower price to be a more flexible and uh, resilient resource in our grid. So energy storage is a necessary part of a clean, flexible, resilient, reliable, and lower cost future grid. And so I, we strongly support this bill to help ensure our, our utilities are that want to innovate and are able to innovate forward can get to that future grid we need. Thank you so much. I'd be happy to take questions if there's any time. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Farah Mandich. Hope I pronounced that all right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Farah Mandich and I work in resource planning for Excel Energy. We'd like to thank Representative Hollins for asking for our input on this bill and for incorporating our feedback into the current version. We support the goal that is expressed in section one of the bill. Xcel Energy has bold carbon reduction objectives. We see energy storage as playing an important role in decarbonizing our system and this bill places procurement determinations within the resource planning process where they can be considered in an integrated context. The language in sections two and three of this bill raise some questions that we haven't fully evaluated, but we're, we look forward to working um, with the author on them. For example, the current language requires utilities to file project applications within a year after the Public Utilities Commission issues an order that includes storage. We believe it may be beneficial to allow more timing flexibility. If the commission found that we need storage on our system, but not until the latter years of our action plan, the current language would require us to file an application several years ahead of the need. Um, and as technology is developing quickly in this space, this may not yield the best pricing or project options for our customers. Um, we also have some questions about the scope of the locational analysis required by the current language and how that aligns with the resource planning process. And finally, I would note that um, the cost recovery section refers to allowing the utility to recover cost net of revenues, and we'd like to better understand the construct envisioned there. Um, but in, in summary, we really appreciate Representative Holland's willingness to work with us, and we look forward to further discussions about this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Manage. Uh, we just have a few minutes left and several hands, so let's go as fast as we can, and we'll have time for maybe one question per member. Representative Grunheg. Oh, thank you, Matt, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, my, my uh, question revolves around a meeting I had uh, about a week ago with a person out of my district, he's a retired uh, electrical engineer. His son works out at MIT in Massachusetts on, on uh, uh, battery storage uh, for electricity. And what they're finding is that when they put the plates so close together to increase the storage amount in batteries, the batteries explode. And the interesting thing, we just had a fire in my community. Uh, they uh, had a tool plugged in the battery exploded and the whole business burned to the ground. It was less than a month ago, right? So the technology's not there. I've even talked to solar manufacturers and they say that the, the soonest possible way to have uh, batteries have decent storage is at least five years away. And that's op, op, you know, an optimi optimistic projection. So before we decommission clean coal, gas, and nuclear. I think we need to look at what the actual science is rather than getting the cart before the horse with these types of bills. Uh, if one of the testifiers wants to respond, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Sure, uh, Ms. Anderson, briefly, and then we'll move on to our next question. Sure, briefly, and thank you for the question. And yes, I've had the privilege of, of meeting with experts at MIT to talk about storage as well. And um, there's a lot you can learn there. Um, I think um, what we know is that um, number one, battery storage technologies are rapidly improving and evolving. And number two, um, a number of cities and states have set up protocols for building safety for battery storage that is deployed inside buildings. And that's important to have in place. And three, there's a lot of battery storage projects that are deployed out in the outdoors in containers or other facilities. So. Certainly fire protection is something that's always considered. And so I'm sorry, there was an example of, of one that um, turned into a disaster, but that's very rare occasion, luckily. And there's also flow batteries and other technologies that are that have no fire hazard at all. Uh, okay, Representative Bowen, I'm uh, sorry, but this will have to be the last question and hopefully folks can follow up with Representative Hollins' bill is being, being laid over. Uh, Representative Bowen. 
Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had two questions, but I'll go with just one. Uh, line 3.15 in cost recovery. I'm wondering who determines or who defines prudently? Because if a utility puts time and money into an effort and then it's determined to be non-prudent for some reason, then that's that's going to make them less likely to try that again. Thank you. Representative Hollins. Thank you so much, Repre uh, Chair. I hear an alarm going off, sorry. And, and thank you, Representative Bo. Um, I, I, my understanding is that it would be the PUC that would decide whether or not this was a prudent effort. And because of all of the planning that would need to go in place and the application, there would be a lot of time to, um, to adjust accordingly and to provide uh, recommendations and feedback to the utility company. Um, you know, before this plan is implemented and therefore before we would need to do cost recovery. Thank you, Representative Hollins. I apologize that we didn't get to every member today. Mr. Chair, uh, can I just jump in and make my comment just very quickly, please? Very quickly, Representative Igo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to jump in since this bill doesn't have a number yet. I was just hoping that maybe I could work with Representative Hollins on when we're talking about batteries, this is a great way for us to utilize our minerals in Northeastern Minnesota. So maybe we could work on your bill utilizing what we have here in Minnesota to have morally and responsible batteries for this project you're working on. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Igo. Um, so with that, members, uh, we are out of time. Um, any closing brief comments, Representative Hollins? Thank you for your consideration and thank you to the testifiers. I appreciate you being here. Thank you all. Uh, our next meeting is Tuesday, March 16th at 1030 a.m. and we are adjourned.